part of the industry. You know, it, the whole goal is like economics and how are we going to get people to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, wanted to try to figure out what you think is going on with the vinyl world and why people should put out vinyl in addition to CDs. And well, I guess the one question is, do you want to put out a CD? Even um, you know, a lot of stores are dropping CDs. Cars are stopping putting CD players in your cars. Um, so you got to know your audience, obviously. I mean, some an audience that would skew more towards my age would probably still buy CDs. Um, that's kind of the ironic thing about it. We get people coming to the plant and they go, oh, I don't know, they still make records, and, and then you say, well, actually, yeah. And, younger generation that's kind of fueling this, there's a huge surprise by that. You know, it's, it just doesn't add up in their minds for some reason or other. Um, you know, when we started the business, um, my thinking was, this was in two, the early 2009, um, saw that record sales had started to increase since 2006, and saw my daughter buying records as well, and kind of intuitively made sense that vinyl was going to keep increasing when you think about the whole evolution of recorded sound from you know, getting myself eight tracks and cassettes, you know, Walkman, MP3 players, you know, it was all about portability, taking music with you. Well, now that argument's kind of over, right? You've got the cloud, you can stream whatever you want, wherever you want it. And yet there's still going to be some people So if you look at physical formats and you go, well, I mean, there's a whole argument about whether vinyl sounds better or not. I prefer not to get caught up in that. I mean, that's a subjective sort of thing. But certainly it's it's more tactile. You know, it's it's larger. You can read the album art. Um, you know, there's some, I mean, you can, there's an artistic expression within the album art itself that isn't really duplicated in the CD cover, no matter what you do. You know, you can put bells and whistles inside. You can put download codes inside, which a lot of our customers do. So somebody who buys the record can go to the web and download the record, you know, at the same time, sort of thing. So that just kind of made sense that people who want something physical would start gravitating toward vinyl, and that seems to be what's happening. Vinyl has gone up year after year since 2006. Uh, 2014 was about 45 percent higher than 2013. 2013 was similarly up over 2012, and this year we're seeing again. So, you know, obviously there's a market for it. Uh, I think it's a niche market. It's never going to be the predominant medium as it was when I was young, but it's a growing niche, and I don't think it's anywhere close to flat. You know, yet. my marker is is when I stop having people come into the plant and say they still make vinyl records. When that's when I stop hearing that, then I know we're probably where we're at. It's probably going to be the ceiling. But when you think about it, Jack White's uh, last album was the biggest vinyl selling album last year. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, around 80,000 units. You know, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot in today's vinyl world, but you think about, you know, with the Mac Rumors selling millions and millions of physical vinyl records. I mean, it kind of gives puts it all in context. When you think 80,000 is a lot, it is in today's world, but in terms of the segment of the population, it's, you know, it's minuscule. So a lot of room for growth, I think. What is the, um, what's the price per unit at this point? Of, uh... Well, that depends. I mean, it, it, it depends on what you do. So a lot of uh, maybe bands that haven't been into vinyl before artists might put out a 7-inch because it's less expensive to do that. Um, you know, if you put out a 12-inch, do you want a, a color record's more expensive than a black record? Gatefold jacket's more expensive, obviously, than a regular single pocket jacket. You know, are you going to have inserts of download codes, or are you going to put, you know, some insert with lyrics in it? It's that sort of thing. So, you know, in general, you're looking at. I think most records are going for. I want to say. Twelve ninety nine, thirteen ninety nine, up to like nineteen ninety nine for a single LP. I think that's generally the range. What you see stores. So, you know, the real question is, can you make money on that? I mean, it's, 
obviously, if you go through this row, then you're going to have to take a smaller slice of the pie versus solving them at a merge table, for example. But in general, you could do a 12 inch uh, with jackets, uh, black records, um, and you're looking at around you know three bucks or so total uh, for that. Uh, but again, you can you know you can escalate that cost by going to things like eight mil jackets and, yeah. and download codes and that sort of thing. So. So there is, I mean, there's clearly, economically, if, you know, if it didn't make sense, we wouldn't have the business. I mean, the economy kind of dictates that, right? So obviously there are bands that are out there making money selling vinyl records today, and labels as well, because labels are getting back into it again in a big way. And you're, how backed up are you? You're running two shifts. Now. We run. Uh, we run two shifts. Uh, we're if we got a 12-inch order today, it's probably going to be mid to late June until it ships. Uh, Seven-inch and 180-gram. We're a little less behind, but that's probably mid-May to late May, something like that. The process itself is there. There's no way to turn around a record like there is a CD. Um, so. If where how a record made is made. The first step is getting a lacquer cut. Um, so we have uh, Clint Holly, we use here as our resident lacquer cutter at Well Made Music. He gets the sound file, loads it in. Well, he's got a queue just like we have of jobs, right? So, you know, he gets a job today, he may not cut it for another week or two. And when he's cutting, it's real time. So if he's cutting, you know, eight jobs a day, that's probably 10 hours worth of work on his part. Then it goes to a plating shop where a metal image called Mother is made. That plating shop also has a queue, so you're looking at probably not getting that Mother made for about a week. And then the stampers, which are the negative image that we get, uh, are made. So from the time we send something to Clint till we get the stampers for a test press is generally about a month and a half. So right out of the gate, you're a month and a half into it. At the same time, you, know, you have to have labels for a record. I, we do make records without labels, but um, most people have labels for their records. So there's artwork associated with that. That generally takes about a month or so to get those. Jackets can take anywhere from a month and a half to two and a half months, uh, depending on who we use and where they're coming from. So ideally, if you're doing a record, you want to have your ducks in a row ahead of time. You have the artwork done. You know, it's well mastered go because you know sometimes what'll happen is we have it's we've sent the test presses out and we still don't have any you know label art from the customer and they'd still like to have them you know in three weeks and you're like well you still don't have the label art from me yet you know it's going to be a little bit longer so the other thing about that is the process um, we may reject the test pressing we listen to them all so if we reject the test pressing then it's a matter of us going back to the plating shop or to the lacquer cutter depending on the issue and it may need to be replated or worst case scenario needs to be recut. So again, you're, you lost you know, several weeks there when that happens too as well. Where do you go to get the um, stampers made? Uh, there's one independent plater left in the States called Mastercraft or out of New Jersey. But we actually, um, uh, the guy who runs sales for us went out on his own and bought some plating equipment because we were trying to convince somebody in Cleveland to open up a plating shop yeah, and, right. yeah, and had no luck doing that. We had a couple of platers that were thinking about it, but they didn't. But we found uh, QCA in Cincinnati, which is um, back in the day, right now they do CDs, but back in the day they actually were a pressing plant and they had in-house lathe cutter and they had in-house plating and all that. So. The son of that owner is still in the business, and we were able to convince him to get back into plating. So they do that just for us, and it's under our name. Um, they aren't up to speed yet enough where they can take on all of our work. Um, and if and when that happens, then we probably open it up to maybe some other vinyl record pressing plants to use them as well. Hmm. So there's a need for, for that still, you think? The, uh, for the, uh, I'm sorry, what the plating? plating? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, in the sense of, of it, there, there are some plants have their in-house, their own captive shops 
uh, a handful of them do. Everybody else uses this place in New Jersey, um, and then of course we use this other place as well. Yeah. So could another plating shop probably get business? Sure. Yeah, I'd say. But that's not a worthwhile expansion of your business. Okay. Well, in a sense, we have because they're doing it under our name. Oh, okay. Um, uh, but in terms of, Something you know, we thought about it. doing it here ourselves, but our learning curve on vinyl alone was enough to, you know, nearly break me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking mentally. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was reluctant to take on more, and the interesting thing is, um, even though this company had played it before, 20-some years ago, it took them another year beyond where we thought they would be ready. You know, so we've been working with them for a couple of years now, and, and even with that experience, you know, it just took them that long to get up and running. And you know, it's a different process. You, it's it's plating baths. You're using you know heavy metal solutions, that sort of thing. So there's permitting involved with it and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I really didn't want to get involved with that. We didn't have. Are there, is there more equipment out there somewhere? Pressing equipment? Yeah, or plating equipment. Plating equipment's pretty hard to come by, and you can make it or have it made for you. Presses are really hard to come by. Uh, interestingly enough, though, um, there's a guy in Kansas, uh, his company's Quality Record Pressing. He, he owns Acoustic Sounds. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. That's a, it's a record label that releases, um, you know, jazz, old, hard-to-find stuff, classic stuff on, like, 200-gram records, very high-end, sells them for, like, you know, 50 bucks, you know, I'm not you know, exaggerating, but that's the retail price for some of these records. And he got tired of having to wait for his records, so he actually found some presses and opened a plant in Kansas a couple of years ago. And he recently found in Chicago 13 presses that had been stored in a warehouse for 20 years wow. and just bought them and moved them to Kansas. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 presses are probably around in places like that, yeah. but people don't necessarily know about them or mm -hmm. where they are. And not only that, I mean, that, to restore those 13 presses and the shape they're in, um, it's going to take a year plus probably to do it. Um, and I'll have to hire people full time to do that. Um, for us, we have uh, stations. We have six presses. We have stations for two more. We have a press from the Bodie plant that you know, we're hoping to get up and running this year. And then uh, I'm looking for one more press. Um, that would be the ideal situation. So that way we're kind of you know, at our floor capacity. And, um, is it? Just economically, it's just not feasible to, to bother building them? Or Yeah, I mean, presses new, uh, as I understand it, uh, were 80000 bucks or so a press. This is back in the late 70s. Mm. Um, my previous life where I used to work, we uh, presses work with compression molding. Uh, it's exactly like it sounds. Um, where I used to work, we had injection molding machines, and we bought machines and machines and you know they would run you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and up. Um, I would think a new press today if one was made would be at least a couple hundred grand minimum. So they would have to show me that press would either have to be able to make records faster uh, or with less scrap or you know obviously more reliable and less repair and you'd have to do cost analysis as to whether it would be while or not yeah. to buy it but um, but I think you know I've heard rumors that somebody's going to come out with a press I'd love to have the uh, opportunity to consider that um, and certainly if things keep going the way they are then it, that's probably going to happen um, it might have been this week I guess a little off topic but so you started this in, you got, got a groove was in 2009 mm -hmm. Um, so you, and you just started it simply because you saw a need for it market-wise, or? Well, I yeah, I believe there was a need for it. I mean, I had a desire to start a business, and I had a 
desire to do it in manufacturing, to do it in the city. So then it was a matter of, you know, what do I want to do? How do you sit for record? So, hey, that looks like it might work out. So, you know, the key thing was trying to find presses. And I don't know if Cindy remembers or not, but I was, I tried, couldn't find them, was about to give up. You know, she was always very encouraging about it. And, and so I went back home that day and I sent four emails out to four existing plants saying, do you know where there's any presses? Thinking, well, they're not. And they're going to respond to me anyway. They don't want anybody else competing with them, probably, you know. And, uh, and two didn't respond, and one said, no, I'm sorry, don't. And one said, yeah, I have some presses and I want to sell them. He had just settled a case with his landlord that he had to be out of his space in two months. And this was a business that was founded in the 40s uh, by his grandfather in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And um, he was in his 40s. He had been there since his early 20s. He wanted to do something else with his life. He didn't want to go through the hassle of moving the equipment. Um, so it literally was that day he settled the case. I sent that email, and he responded. And, well, okay, well, fly out there and see. You know, this probably isn't going to happen. And I went out there, and he told me what he wanted. I'm like, gee, maybe this can happen, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, we actually had lunch one day because I was thinking about selling the beach land. He was thinking about maybe being part of that beach land, mm -hmm. right? And we just sort of started talking. I'm like, well, what else would you want to do? And he said, I want to start a vinyl pressing plant. And I go, well, well, wait a minute. You're not getting the beach land. you got to go do this right now. <laughs> and he yeah, did. Yeah, so it, <laughs> and he did. And it was, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, you could, I don't know, you know, what you believe in kind of thing. I mean, it's like a karma kind of stuff going on or whatever, but... You know, I mean, if I had waited a couple of days, that guy might have found somebody else, or yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, yeah. it was, uh, you know, it was serendipity. There are times I think, wow, <laughs> why did that happen? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but for the most part, it's clear that it happened. Yeah. Had Had you run other businesses before? Uh, I I was in management with another company for a long time. Yeah, so had some experience with P and L statements and. Decisions and that kind of thing. Yeah. In manufacturing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually an attorney by background. That's where I started as in house counsel with this other company and then moved over to the operations form. Nice. So, how many people do you employ now? Uh, 26. Wow. I'm in the process of hiring two more people. And can the machines only take two shifts worth of, of work? Uh, well, sometimes they can't take 10 minutes. So, um, yeah, I, I think in, in some ways when a machine's running, it's, it's actually good to just keep it running. So there's some advantage sometimes to just running it and running it and running it. Um, it they're, they're unpredictable. There isn't a day that goes by that a machine doesn't need some sort of mechanical attention. Most of the time, fortunately, it's minor, and sometimes it's, you know, it's bigger than that. You know, it's just the nature of the equipment. You know, you're working with stuff that's 40 years old, going on 40 years old almost, you know, well over 30 years old. Yeah. Yeah. But every plant's in the same situation. Right. Yeah. So you have to have a good mechanic. That's key. Yeah. And that person is not me. So. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have somebody on call all the time, or are they? Well, we have somebody full time. Who yeah, whose responsibility is mechanical work on machines. Yeah. And our press operators are are trained some more than others to do some minor mechanical repairs. Are you thinking of going to a third shift yet? Um, no, I, I'd prefer to get these other this, these other two presses. To me, that just makes more sense, and then then think about it from there. And part of me wants to avoid it just because. Um, we went to a second shift. There was certainly a big learning curve for the newer employees, and um, you know, the, the whole and it's maybe my personality, but you know, keeping the phone by your bed at night kind of thing. You know, it, it, it's, you know, second shift. You know, the calls can come as late as you know midnight or one in the morning, but you know, third shift it could be three in the morning or four in the morning or whatever. And it's tough to find. It's easier to find people who are willing to work second shift. It, it, it accommodates. Schedules and a third shift does. A third shift is just kind of a, you know, 
pe most people who work third shift um, want to get off third shift, you know. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah that's so, true. I yeah. guess that's true. Yeah. But it's a consideration. If that's what we have to do at some point, that's what we'll do. Yeah. Um, you hire a lot of musicians? Yeah, musicians? quite a few. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's obviously... How's that working out? Well, that's, it's, yeah, that's a, yeah, you know, that's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, I, well, I used to work, you know, we had hundreds of employees, so people are people, and it's, it'd be easy to say, well, it's because, you know, this person's a musician that they're this way, but it's, it's, it's not the case, you know, we've got, you know, you, you can say, okay, well, there are some who, you know, are, you know, well, we're working a first shift, we start at seven in the morning, had a gig the night before, you know, you're still supposed to be there at seven, sorry, you know, uh, you know, and, and that's hard for some people, and we're pretty flexible when, you know, somebody says, hey, you know, I've got a gig, and can I come in at eight, and it seems like we have enough coverage, or whatever, yeah, that's fine, you know, we'll, we'll do that, um, but, it, you know, on the whole, it's been a good thing, because in my experience, you know, you can't teach passion, you either have it for whatever you're doing or you don't, and you know we're a manufacturing operation, so it's it's manufacturing, you know, and we're not making widgets, we're making wet records. But if you already feel strongly about records, then you're going to feel better about your job and what you do, and, you know. So in that case, I think it's been, on the whole been very good, and certainly they, you know, help spread the word. We've got some folks who you know toured and they you know lots of people. People know them, and so you know, what plan should we use? Oh man, you know, so where I work, kind of. Hey. Yeah. Very day off. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Mark O'Shea. I'm a Dude. plus. I'm a plus. Do you have you met Vince before ever? No. We have. Hi, how are you, Mark? Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hi. Mark is the, uh, I saw you play last night. I saw you sing last night. I haven't seen anybody else yet. <laughs> Excellent. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry. Well, well, with hiring, with hiring as many musicians as you have, is there, and because it's a record plant, is there an accommodation for if they tour or if they, you know? Yeah, we were more flexible about that mm -hmm. before. Uh, we were less, because we weren't as busy, you yeah. know, I mean, when we first started out, so, it, yeah, it's, it's, we actually have somebody going on tour for, in Europe for five weeks, he leaves in a couple of weeks, and he and I talked about it, I said, you know, I, I can't have a job open for that long, which he understood, and he's never done this before in his life, and his feeling was, you know, I, I got to do this, I said, well, I understand completely why you want to do it, and the experience, and but fortunately, actually, it worked out that we were hiring somebody else, and just the way schedules and things are overlapping, we were, we were going to be able to take them back. So, yeah, that was actually the first case of where I had to tell somebody, and I can't, can't do it. We have some people who, you know, they, they, uh, most of the folks now do with their touring, uh, they're doing these weekend gigs, like out of town stuff. There's not a whole lot of, at least with my current employee group, of, of that stuff going. Are you running on Saturdays, too? Uh, we work a lot of Saturdays, yeah. We work probably, on average, 70% of the Saturdays, I'd say. Yeah. And we even worked a few Sundays last year as well. I wanted you to explain the um, in, like Indiegogo kind of thing that you have built into ordering a record. You mean like the crowdfunding yeah, the stuff? Crowdfunding yeah, the crowdfunding stuff. Because yeah, like we have something called GrooveBot, which Groovebot. really hasn't been as successful as we had hoped. I mean, it's a, it's a Kickstarter-like thing. Um, you know, the advantage of stars was that if you raised $500, we would start the project, whereas I think with Kickstarter, you had to have the money raised or something like that before. And and our, the fees for ours are slightly lower. Ours is 7%. Started ranges, I think, from eight to ten percent. Um, but that said, um, probably I was talking to my sales guy. He he estimates about fifty percent of what we do is crowdfunded in a sense. And by that I mean um, 
it isn't just necessarily Kickstarter, but it's pre-orders. So a lot of folks, you know, start publicizing what they're going to do and just take pre-orders for it. And that's the way they build up the cash to put the deposit down to make the records and to have the cash, you know, when the records are done and ready to ship. So it's quite, it's, you know, that's a pretty hefty number. Um, and as a, I mean, that's, particularly since we do a fair amount of label business, big label business, so, um, which of course has got nothing to do with any of that. Right. How much did you say? 40? About 50%, 50%, maybe. 50%. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, but I think, again, that's a lot of that is, is more, I mean, certainly there's more Kickstarter than there is a in-house thing, um, but there's more pre-orders than in-house. And a lot of it are smaller record labels. We do this with a bunch of smaller they're taking pre-orders on their projects. Well, is the in-house Kickstarter that you have, I'm sorry, Groovebot? Groovebot, yeah. Groovebot, is it, are you finding it not successful because people aren't meeting the cap, or it's just not being utilized as much? It's just not being utilized, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. For, it's, I think it's just a matter of, you know, if you're thinking of doing that, what do you think of? You automatically think of Kickstarter, right? So you just go right there and you go down that road. You know, you'd have to go to our site, and you'd see that on our front page. But if that's not what you're, you know, if you're not clicking on it, then you're not going to be doing it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just think you don't. People don't realize that you're offering that service. Right, so right. Well. I think it is. It's 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 somewhat of a marketing thing on our end. Yeah. Because yeah. you did we. The Ken project yeah. was very successful. Right. You use it, yeah. The other thing to think about, too, in, in, in releasing a record and, and you try to really, can't overemphasize this enough, actually, is um, don't pick a release date or show date and, um, and then start the process. Um, the best thing to do is to wait to do that until at least you've listened to test pressings and they're okay um, because, you know, it's nothing worse than, okay, my release date, I'm having a record release party at the Happy Dog on, or Beachland on such and such a date, and you don't have the records, you know, that's uh, the last thing you want to have happen. So, um, we've done a lot of trying to educate people about that, just, you know, you're better off just waiting and you know, kind of tempering your expectations a little bit for a while, uh, don't get the cart ahead of the horse sort of thing. And what's going on with uh, record store days? That, that kind of jams everything up right now, right? Well, it, it does and it doesn't. I mean, we, you know, we we started the company and our focus remains on the independent artists or bands or whatever. We, even though we do some label business, um, we intentionally limited the amount of record store day stuff we would do with labels um, so we could accommodate our consistent customers. Um, it certainly affects plants around the world, obviously, but um, I, I can't say that we're any, we might be slightly busier during this time, but not wildly busier. Uh, and most of the record store day stuff is already shipped. We have a hand, couple of projects yet that have yet to ship, but most of it all shipped uh, early this month. So as Clay probably talked about with distribution, there's that whole timeline they so we had to get records to certain places uh, during this month, earlier this month. So I think we're doing probably twelve to fifteen records for day projects. What about the digital download codes? You you provide those, or how how is that? We can, yeah. We actually have a hosting service, so you can get those through us, uh, and we'll print the cards and put them in the albums. Some of our customers will use whomever and they'll ship us the codes and you know we'll package them up for them. So you can make those separately, like you can just make download codes for bands? Yeah, we have a template with art and stuff and you know, so yeah, so we just drop the art the jacket art on this little you know, But I mean that's that's a separate product someone could order if they oh, didn't want yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody could just order download codes, yeah. Yeah. Somebody can do that. Yeah. We we have a, every year we get a couple of those orders. Do you work with um, 
CD pages. I have a bunch of meetings today. I can't see it. You could just send me the notes. I'd appreciate it. Sure. You know the answer. I can't see it. How about you can see? I can see. I'm talking vinyl. <laughs> I keep buying for some reason. That's a good thing. Yeah. I'm sorry, what did you do? Um, would you work, if somebody wants to do X number of um, records, oh, but okay. in this number of CDs, do you use it? Uh, well, we would probably recommend them to a CD replicator who would handle it on their end unless they wanted it packaged together. So we did any longer, but we did a lot of yep rock releases, and, and their demographic again kind of skewed a little, at least for some a little older. So they would do the records, and then put put them in a resealable poly bag, and a, inside the poly bag was a CD as well. Um, yeah, so I mean we could integrate all the packaging of that, but we wouldn't handle the actual production of the CD. the smallest press that you can do? Uh, we, do, do, do. we do as little as 100. Yeah. yeah, again, it gets kind of to the economics because, um, it, you know, we'll get some people, somebody will call me on the phone, and I've got a copy of uh, Led Zeppelin II. It's really worn out. I'd like a new one. Can you make me one? No, no. <laughs> well, a couple of things. One is... Do you have the licensing rights for that? <laughs> Which is probably the hardest part of it. And, and and number two, that's going to be the most expensive record you own because you know the lacquer cutting has to happen and the plating, whether you make one record or ten thousand records. So out of the gate, you're looking at six hundred and eighty-five dollars for that twelve-inch record. You know, so so the more records you do, the more you drop your per piece cost. Um, so that's a matter then of trying to figure out, okay, how many do I think I can sell? Am I going to cover my expenses or not? Um, you know, I don't want to be stuck with 200 records in my basement five years from now. Um, but the one good thing is that, and we, we try to encourage our customers who have these questions to be conservative because you can repress the record. So you've already paid for the cutting. You already have the plates made. Uh, we get 1,500 labels, whether it's a 100-record job or a 1,000-record job. Uh, if you order jackets, um, yeah, jackets, that's the one thing where you usually don't have that many leftover jackets. But anyway, so you've got those three pieces already covered. So then you're just looking at the cost of the record, basically. So uh, it makes more sense to say, okay, I'm going to make 300 records, and I'm pretty sure I can sell those. And, uh, you know, Stampers, we guarantee for a thousand press cycles. So I want another two hundred now. Okay, you know it's going to be a lot less expensive for you. So do you store the stampers there? Uh, we did for the first couple of years, and then it got crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our policy now is we return the stampers and extra print to the customers at the end of the job. If they want to repress, they send them back to us. Um, some of our larger customers, it's just the nature of you have to store the stuff. It's, you can't get away from it. Uh, that's what they expect. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we do. And some, a lot of them just say, you know, I don't want it back. So our, our standard policy is, we'll hold on to stuff for three months. And if you want to repress it in that period of time, you know, just let us know. Um, yeah. What would be the turnaround on like a repress? It, I'm going to say it's not really faster per se because our schedules are scheduled so when a job comes in you know we schedule it you know, so it's coming in today here's the schedule in June we're slotting that in for this day or for this many hours um, so we would do the same with a repress now what happens just the natural ebb and flow of things some jobs move faster than others some don't holes develop in the schedule I could pull this. So what we do with represses is we use those to fill the, we pull the repress back, you know. So, um, you know, frequently a repress will get done, you know, within a month after they ask for it. Um, but that's not always the case. It must be crazy scheduling. Who does under scheduling? Uh, well, you know, I did it for a long time, and uh, it was, 
it, and it's a full time job. Um, and so my my oldest son works with us, and he's doing production scheduling now, which has been a, a major relief for me. Um, yeah, because it, it literally changes several times a day, every day. Um, I mean, it's not the stuff that you schedule out here. It's what you have scheduled today. This stamper got scratched. Uh, this happened. That happened. This needs to be juggled around. You know, it just yeah, it's everyday stuff happens that needs to have attention to the schedule. So. But you're getting jobs to people in Cleveland, which is really good. Well, it's nice to be part of that. We'll do to give you an idea that that we'll probably do. Let's see where we at right now. But we'll probably do. 1,500 jobs this year, different projects. Last year we did um, 1,400. And how many local records are you seeing go to the of musicians? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've never really sat down and crunched the numbers, but, but when I think about it, my, my guess is we do somewhere between, somewhere around 5% our stuff is what I would term to be local or regional, Northeast Ohio. But we sell, you know, sent some test presses to China today. I always get a kick out of that because, you know, China doesn't have a record pressing plant, so we, we're exporting to China, which is kind of funny. That's um, awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So I just, just so FYI, um, I should also David an email about this. Um, so I was talking to Kent Smith, um, who uh, ran for state rep and won his seat, and I was talking to him about getting um, expanding the tax credits in the state of Ohio because we, there's tax credits for fil the film industry, mm -hmm. but not for the music industry. Mm -hmm. So he put in legislation proposal at five o'clock last night Wonderful. to. Do twenty five percent of anything of five. You have to put five thousand dollars in to do a recording project, mm -hmm. but you can get a tax credit. Well, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so that'd be great. Cross the yeah, yeah, helps elevate our ability to, right. to do this. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Regularly, yeah. I'm excited about that. That's a recording project from start to finish. Yeah, so if you've got, an, inve if you've got an investor, mm -hmm. if you got an investor, it could be just a recording. It could be just going into the studio. Um, but if you put $5,000 into a recording project, and I, that's a good point. I, have to, uh, I will have to ask him about like, actually crossing a record because I didn't think about that. Yeah. I, think, I thought more about the creative than he took a... Louisiana has such a uh, provision, and he used that for the language. I'm going to have to figure out what they do down there. Well, I heard you mention film trip. Is it Nick's in this class usually? Or? Nick is usually in this class. But, but um, we did two of their records. Existential? Yeah. For how, how many, like, for like a band like that, like how many presses, how many records are you using? Uh, I think they did 500. And I'll say that that is probably our, uh, if you ask me what's the most common size run, that's what it is, it's 500. Um, um, what's, what's the time on 7 inches between 12 inches? Uh, you're talking about, no, so like, uh, uh, the actual time available. Time of it, yeah. So, um, with the seven inch, if it's cut at forty five, you're looking at probably tops four minutes. Mm -hmm. If it's cut at thirty three, like six and a half minutes okay. aside. Okay. Yeah. And you don't have a ten inch press. No, you don't have a ten inch press, no. Because we were talking about Yeah, I mean it's actually so the presses themselves, uh, you know, we could make a ten inch press. It's just a matter of modifying dies and that it's just not a big enough market. Yeah. You know, it's just you know, we thought about it but Because they're doing, did um, any of the Ken Jansen people get to you about their, I think they 
they want to press 45s for 10s benefit. Well, we're doing a 12 inch. For You're that. doing the 12 inch? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. yeah I think I'm pretty sure it's 12 inch. Yeah. Just, just one 12 inch. Yeah. I wasn't sure what they decided to end up at. Yeah. I'm working with Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Cool. You don't do that in your, your printing, right? You said jackets and everything. Well, we, we, we will handle all that. So we have templates on our website for labels and jackets and all that. So I mean, we don't do any of the design. We have several different vendors. So, um, but you know, we're we're happy to do as much or as little as the customer wants. So some people have their own lacquer cutter that they use. Yeah, okay, fine. You know, some people say, "I take care of my jackets myself. I just want you to ship me the records and the sleeves." Okay. Some people say, "Well, I'm going to send you my jackets, and you can put them together for me." Okay, we'll do that too. You know, but probably seventy-five percent of what we do, we're handling. Uh, there's a couple local that do things like stickers and inserts for us, but there's nobody local who can make jackets. Interesting. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why, why do you think that is? Because the press isn't the right size, or...? Yeah. I mean, it's just a matter of they don't have the machinery, you know, to be able to do it. first started, I thought, okay, well, gap prints probably would, could make jackets, but you know, they don't. You know. I think you can get jackets through jack prints, but they aren't made. No. What else do you see that is maybe needed as a complementary business to what you're doing? Anything that's missing in the market? Hmm. Nothing comes immediately to mind. I mean, it's it's you know the first two things that came to mind were lacquer cutting and plating. Right? So you know we were fortunately able to find the folks in Cincinnati. Unfortunately, Clint was looking to do something, and when we first started in the business, I, uh, I went to Suma. I don't know if anybody here knows Paul at Suma, but uh, um, I talked to him about maybe you know wanting to be our lacquer cutter. He just didn't seem terribly interested in it, and, and really, he doesn't seem to be terribly fond of computers and technology. I mean, you know, we are constantly. 